thank you everyone for joining us on this webinar. Um, we had a lot of positive feedback from the first one we did a few weeks ago, and a lot of requests to do another one and to have this recording available. So um, this time we're recording it and we'll have it available on our YouTube channel afterwards. But um, first I wanna also thank Kim Roberts and Trista Pfeifenberger, both from CPSN for joining us again on this webinar. Kim Roberts is the lead for pharmacy informatics and partnership innovations at CPESN USA. And Trista Pfeifenberger is the director of operations and quality. Thank you both for joining us today. Glad to be here. Jump right into our portion of the presentation. This is Trista. So our goal, Kim and, and I, are just simply to set up sort of the concepts around CPSN networks and why the eCare plan capability is a critical component not only to the work that we're doing with CPSN networks, but also to community pharmacies generally. So we're going to walk through that for the first 20 minutes or so, and then we'll transition over to a demo of the BestRx eCare plan capabilities. So first, just to start, the realities of healthcare in America, this is probably very apparent to you, but about 10% of the healthcare budget is spent on medications, and about 90% is spent on everything else, hospitalizations, outpatient medical care, labs, emergency department visits, emergency transportation, you name it. However, the irony there is you know that if you provide care for your patients in the pharmacy, what changes is not so much the spend on drugs, but the spend on the medical component of the budget. So the irony right now is that there are lots of narrow networks developing. You know that in your pharmacies, you can't possibly sell drugs below cost, but the narrow networks that are developing right now are based on drug dispensing costs. However, in your pharmacies, all of you are on this webinar today because you believe in providing care and service to your patients in addition to dispensing prescriptions. And because of that, when you provide that care and service, where you actually move outcomes and influence healthcare costs is on the medical side of the budget. And so really, we, what we really want to do at CPSN USA is create a marketplace for a narrow network that's based on quality. And so that is exactly what we are striving to do. When you look at what's on the screen right now, you can think of the marketplace as having several different types of patient populations. And we're starting to see a little bit of a bifurcation in who's focusing on which population. So me and my family, for instance, the most common thing that we need from a pharmacy standpoint is an antibiotic at 8 p.m. on a Thursday night after we leave the pediatrician and gosh, we may also be out of milk that we need for tomorrow morning too. That is very much the needs of our uh, family, which is more of a convenience care marketplace down in the bottom left. In your pharmacies, chances are you take care of patients who are maybe homebound. They don't have transportation. They have very complex medication regimens that without the type of supports you provide like adherence packaging and med sync, it would be hard for those patients to adhere to those regimens based on the complexity of their medical conditions and their overall plan of care. And those patients up in the top right, those are the ones that really cost the system a lot of money, but that's also where we can create lots of opportunity around outcomes and return on investment. And most of you on this call, you're likely on here because you're already focusing on that population in the top right, the one that's more complex, that's higher risk, and most likely higher cost. So the idea behind CPSN pharmacies, we are really, our mission statement is the sustainability, the financial sustainability of community-based pharmacy. And we aim to do that by connecting pharmacies that are focused on services and quality to opportunities in the market to basically participate in payer programs that are focused on services, not just the dispensed prescriptions. And so the pharmacies that join CPESN networks which by the way, we often get asked, what does CPSN stand for? Um, right now it's simply CPSN, but in its origination, it was Community Pharmacy Enhanced Services Network. So these pharmacies provide those enhanced services. They go above and beyond filling prescriptions. They do things like actively coordinate care with physicians. They try to um, influence patient behavior, try to help people manage their diabetes better. If they want to quit smoking, then you're going to work with them to quit smoking. You go above and beyond and do those types of things. Again, home delivery, uh, adherence packaging, in addition to just filling the prescription. 
How CPSN is structured is a clinically integrated network. Clinically integrated networks, or CIN for short, have existed on the physician side for many years. And the idea is that they allow groups of providers, including groups of pharmacies, to come together, even though they are under different legal structures and different financial structures, it allows them to come together under the auspices of clinical integration, and they are allowed to present um, opportunities for payment to the marketplace, to the healthcare marketplace, to payers of different kinds, under, again, the focus on quality. So with the idea that you are either offering a new or better service, or you're able to offer that service and overall lower cost. So with the focus on quality and lowering costs, that's really what clinical integration is all about. But the key for you as an independently owned community pharmacy is that it allows you, much like many uh, other pharmacies around the country, maybe are uh, all under one organization that has thousands or thousands of pharmacies in it, and a payer can go to them and get a sign single signature contract. What a clinically integrated network offers to you is the ability for you and pharmacies that are like you and joining CPSN networks to have that same signature ability. So we're able to go to a payer and say, here's a group of pharmacies that are focused on quality, that are creating a better service offering for your patients, for your members. How can we get you connected in a program? Next slide, Kim. So there are five minimum required services for pharmacies that participate in CPSN networks. They're listed here. The willingness to do medication reconciliation after a care transition, like discharge from the hospital, doing medication synchronization, but really doing so in a way that it's not just autofill, that you're really trying to monitor how the patient is doing uh, along the lines of care planning, providing immunizations or screening and referring for immunizations, conducting comprehensive medication reviews, and providing the patient with a current and up-to-date medication list. All pharmacies that participate in CPSN USA, which we're currently at about 1,800 pharmacies across the country, all of them are committed to those five key services. The idea to a clinically integrated network, again, what under antitrust law, clinical integration is a special uh, consideration. And again, under the notion of providing a higher quality product or lowering costs, we're able to come together and aggregate pharmacies that are otherwise under different ownership to negotiate. Um, with the marketplace, with payers. And the e-care plan that we're going to talk about today is absolutely key in our ability to do that. Why is that? Well, first of all, if you're going to take care of your patients, you need to make sure that somebody knows you're taking care of your patients. And one way that people find that out is by you just documenting the little things that you do day in and day out to take care of your patients. You find a problem, you resolve it. You realize the patient needs some education, you give them that education. Chances are you're doing these things all the time and you might not be documenting them. But the way the rest of the healthcare system can start to understand the value you bring is to really start capturing that information, the type of care that you're providing to your patients so you can share it with the rest of the system. Kim will talk about what the e-care plan is and how it helps you do that. But the data on the CPSN side is critical for care coordination purposes, for quality assurance purposes, and also potentially for participation in a program. It could be that an e-care plan, completion of an e-care plan for a given patient might allow you to receive payment under certain types of programs. This is an example of a quality report that CPSN networks and pharmacies receive. The idea is that we receive care plan data from each participating pharmacy. That's one of the key components of our quality assurance strategy and we review those on a regular basis and give feedback back to the pharmacies and networks. The idea is that we all get better together. We identify which pharmacies have best practices. We share that information across the network and we can all get better together over time using these types of data for quality assurance purposes. In terms of who joins a CPSN network, you may be sitting here saying, hmm, this is interesting. Maybe I haven't heard about this before. How would I know if I'm right for this? From a high-level standpoint, if you know that you do things for your patients that keep them out of the hospital or that prevent an emergency department visit, chances are you're a good fit. If you actively have programs in place or services that help patients achieve their medical outcomes, like lowering hemoglobin A1C or hitting a target blood pressure, that is absolutely a good sign that you're an excellent fit for a CPSN network. If you work with your patients to help them achieve their health goals, Smoking cessation, for example, that's a great um, way to identify a fit for CPSN networks. And then if you have other 
relationships with healthcare team members. Maybe you have um, a situation where the local hospital refers you patients. Maybe you have um, different kinds of relationships with local physician practices where they refer you high-risk patients. Those sort of working relationships that are different than other community pharmacies have are a good sign that you're a strong fit for a CPSN participation. So where we are right now, this is our slide from the last we gave this webinar, which we have grown a little bit. Our CPSN networks are constantly growing. So right now, we are at 1,800 pharmacies, and we are across, I believe it's 48 networks right now across 43 states. So we've even grown since um, this webinar, which was about six weeks ago, to your other counterparts that are BestRx customers. So you've, if you look at the map and see the states that are gray, is where we do not yet have a network. The states that have either the CPSN logo or a specific logo for that network on there are where we have a presence right now. So we invite you to learn more about this. It is a um, pharmacy governed network. So real quickly, we are structured as a limited liability um, company, but our two member owners are both not-for-profit organizations. So we really exist to be um, of, by, and for community pharmacies. Our board is made up of 14 leads from the local CPSN networks represented on this slide. So the pharmacies and the pharmacy owners out in the networks really determine how CPSN works for them. So if it all, this all sounds like something that might be interesting to you, we encourage you to contact the email at the bottom of the screen, info, I-N-F-O, at cpsn.com and we can definitely connect you with the local leadership in your area and get you more information about participating. And this is just a reminder. And then before I hand it off to Kim, the one thing I would just like to say is really, um, I hope you all give um, your, your vendor and BestRx a lot of credit for developing the eCare plan. Kim's really gonna talk to you about what the eCare plan means for your pharmacy. But from our standpoint, if you are a pharmacy that again is committed to care and service, in the world that we're quickly evolving to, you have to be able to document that and show what you're doing for your patients. And so having that ability to document clinical work right in your pharmacy management system and then have it produce a care plan that could communicate with the rest of the healthcare world on the back end of the system, that is an incredible tool that BestRx has given to you. So we just wanna congratulate um, BestRx for being one of the first to really commit to developing that for their users and hopefully Kim, um, and Hemel, the rest of this hour will really highlight how this tool will be of value to you. So with that, I will I'll, um, hand it over to Kim. Thank you, Trista. And really the pharmacist um, e-care plan, it was based off of, you know, the care plan that's used readily in, a, a, you know, a clinic setting or in a hospital setting. So it's an, really what's called an HL7 standard. It's not a platform. Um, it's going to contain your latest clinical data for any given patient and it's agnostic to any vendor, and it's considered what's an open standard. So anyone can use it and adopt it. So from the uh, pharmacist care plan overview perspective, um, this was really based on um, what was needed from a medication management perspective. Really when the folks at NCPDP and HL7, when they were developing this, they really try to align the, the sections that are needed for a care plan based on uh, what is considered the JCPP, pharmacist patient care process, of how a patient take care, takes care of a patient regardless of the care setting. So regardless of the care setting, you know, you're collecting your information, you're assessing that information, and then once you assess and identify problems, uh, you create your plan for a given patient, you implement that plan, and then you follow up and monitor and evaluate that over, over given time. And so this is something, as you can see, you're constantly continuously evaluating. And so each time you just basically follow the circles and continue to collect, assess, and plan. And so really, you know, what we want to do with the pharmacy care plan is really wanted to have pharmacy choice of your technology vendor. And so that's what, you know, really going on what Trista said about BestRx is one of the first ones to really kind of um, take this to heart and uh, do the development for it. Um, it's really sp specifically designed for data exchange. It captures information that results from pharmacists taking care of patients. And it's, you know, something that, you know, you own this data unless you've signed it away and you can direct it where you'd like it to go. You know, whether it's to CPS in USA or um, as it moves forward, you know, hopefully they'll go to health systems and things of that nature. Think about it this way. Most of you are probably participants in Outcomes or Marixa, right? And so you have to go into a different system to get that documentation done. And really the way pharmacy has been structured up until now 
for each new payer program, you never know what platform someone's going to ask you to go to. And at some point, that's not scalable anymore. And so the idea here is that if we can get all of pharmacy and, and the healthcare system to rally around the notion that a pharmacist care plan and the information in it is the way we identify and, and get that documentation we need as evidence of pharmacist provided services, then you can do that within your own platform without X payer telling you to go to A platform and Y payer saying if you use B platform, because again, obviously over time, that's not scalable. So think about it that way. And when you're documenting this information, it could be, hey, I'm working with an asthma patient. They're refilling their albuterol all the time, and I see they don't have a maintenance inhaler. Well, that's something you handle on a daily basis, but that can be documented in the e-care plan. If you have a lab result from somebody, you have a, di a patient with diabetes and you know their hemoglobin A1C or you collected a blood pressure for someone in your pharmacy today, those are the type of things that can be documented within um, the pharmacist e-care plan. Some of those I just described are more future states. Some are existing in the current um, state because it will sort of grow and evolve over time. But don't think about this as something that is so complex that you're, you're not sure what, you would, what type of information you would put in here today. The fact that you're doing home delivery or adherence packaging, those are interventions you would want to put in the care plan, for instance. So sorry, Kim, I just wanted to help everyone uh, translate this to their day-to-day -day activity. Absolutely. And so in the background with some of the things that you're going to be documenting um, are things, um, what's called SNOMED CT codes. And so this is basically, you know, um, Trista mentioned delivery. So if you're doing medication synchronization, there are uh, codes for that for things that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's really a way of uh, kind of collating and collecting the data, you know, whether it's you're identifying a, a medication therapy problem, whether it's your whatever intervention, whether that was you provided education to the patient, there's ways of codifying that, which you, you know, really don't need to know the, the code. You just need to know how to document the information and the, the, the activities that you're doing in a given day. So um, this is basically kind of gives you kind of basic functionality. And a lot of this, you know, if you look at it, is things that's actually being captured um, by your, you know, pharmacy management system. You know, you have patient demographic information. You're going to have payer information, allergy information that you may already have entered, as well as the prescription fill history information. So there's a lot of information here that you, you know, is kind of in the background that's included that you really don't have to do any additional documentation. You know, simple things like, you know, why are you seeing the patient? It could be that they, um, you're doing, you know, the hemoglobin A1C uh, point of care testing. It could be that you're, um, you know, they were just referred from a transitional care perspective and you're following up to see if there's any medication therapy problems. Uh, you could be providing interventions and education um, for these patients. Uh, you could have received a referral from a physician in your area, and um, you could be doing some care coordination based on transitional care, documenting patient goals that the patient may have. And from an outcome perspective, it's really just basically have the, uh, the goals been achieved or not achieved. This is just kind of a basic um, example of a care plan. Um, for asthma. So Dr. Smith referred Timmy to the local pharmacy's asthma management program. The pharmacist scheduled an appointment with Timmy's mother to review his history and current symptoms. Timmy is a seven-year-old boy with moderate persistent asthma and a dust mite allergy. He likes playing soccer and running around at recess, but his asthma symptoms keep him home from school at least two days per month, and he has gone to the ED for uncontrolled asthma symptoms. So you can see the medications that, he on, that he's on, and um, he does use a spacer in it with his inhalers and his appropriate technique, and has an appropriate technique and good adherence to his chronic meds. But you find that his peak flow meter had got lost about three months ago when the family moved. He also is li lives at home with his parents, and you discover that his uncle, who smokes cigarettes in the house, is also living with them. So this is some of the information that's collected in the background. So you, you know, they were referred from a doctor. You're doing asthma medication review, asthma education, and this was your initial assessment of this patient, and this shows the medication list. Patient goals uh, could be less sick days from school because of Timmy's asthma, less trips to the emergency room for Timmy's asthma, limiting Uncle John from smoking inside the house, drug therapy problems, the asthma symptoms were not controlled with the low-dose fluticasone, overuse of albuterol inhaler, and from a care coordination perspective, you note that secondhand cigarette smoke in the home and that there was no peak flow meter. 
interventions that you may have done, I request a new prescription for peak flow meter, recommend increase in dose of the fluticasone to the doctor, the asthma medication review, and you're also educating Timmy's mom about secondhand smoke and asthma, along with educating Timmy's mom on the techniques to minimize dust mite exposure. So as we move forward, we're, um, you know, with different payer opportunities, we'll also adopt additional sections from the standard. So some of these sections, excuse me, uh, would be problem observation and encounter diagnosis, assessments, self-care activities, mental status observation, smoking status, functional status observation, lab results, social history, vital signs, caregiver characteristics, and immunizations. And so really when you're starting about talking about getting started with an e-care plan, try to think of uh, three to five of your most complex high-risk patients. Uh, patients with frequent ED visits or hospitalizations, patients in your SYNC program whose medications are frequently changing month to month, patients with many different prescribers involved in their care. Uh, recruit those patients into your SYNC program if they're not already in it. Each month with the SYNC process, begin asking the patient questions about their disease state uh, in addition to regular SYNC questions. Each month with the SYNC process, begin asking the patient questions about their disease state control in addition to the regular SYNC questions. Have you been to the hospital, urgent care, or emergency department in the, in the past month? For patients with certain medical conditions, like as, such as diabetes, what was your highest blood sugar in the past week? What was your lowest blood sugar in the past week? For heart failure, how often do you weigh yourself? What was your most recent weight? And asthma, how often are you using your rescue inhaler? So by asking these questions, you will inevitably find drug therapy problems and identify that one or more interventions are needed to resolve them. You update the care plan with each sink fill. You slowly take it to the next level. Notes from coordinating care with other health care providers, patient goals for his, her own health. And over time, you add more patients. Krista, would you like to add anything else before we turn it over to Himmel? No, I think hopefully that gives you some idea of how to get started. In addition to, you can just start uh, grabbing those little interventions. So what Kim just described is ways that you can identify entire patients, that you can create a full care plan for them. The other way to get started is simply saying, okay, you know, I, um, we found a drug therapy problem today and we fixed it, or we want to make sure we document it so that we don't lose track of it so that we can fix it. Just putting that one thing in or that one element of patient education, whatever it might be, the fact that you have all your patients on adherence packaging, those sorts of things are also other ways to get started in the system. And so um, thanks so much, and we hope you look forward to the demo. Kim and Trista, thank you so much for that. That was really helpful. And now um, for everyone, we will go over a demo of how this works in BestRx. So I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, so now everyone should be able to see my screen at this point now. Um, this is the window that you guys are all familiar with, the Best Rx system. You guys process your prescriptions here every day. And for those who already have the eCare feature enabled in your system, you'll know that you have this new menu item up here called eCare Plans. And that's where you would go when you want to create a new eCare plan. So I'm going to click on that one and click on eCare Document. So it comes up and brings up this screen where you can see all the different eCare plans that you've done in the past. So I can see I have a couple of ones that I've published in the past, and then I have one that's saved as a draft. And here, you know, if you had more eCare plans, once you get your program started, um, you'll have ways where you can search and narrow things down here. Now, I'm going to run through a demo of how to create an eCare plan using that example that Kim had um, shown us in the slides of Timmy with his asthma. So what I'm going to do here right now is click on create new eCare document up here. And when I do that, it comes over here and now I can go and select the patient that I want to work with. So Timmy didn't have a last name in the slide, so I just gave him a last name of CPESN. So here we have Timmy CPESN. So he's a seven-year-old boy, so that's what I have right here. So that's what I've chosen. Now, the service event is gonna be kind of like the encounter reason. Why are we creating this e-care plan to begin with? So the reason we wanted to create this e-care plan, as Kim had mentioned, is for asthma medication review. So I'm gonna start searching for asthma, and you'll see there's a few things here. And so asthma medication review is the one that I'm gonna choose over here. And 
you may have heard Kim and Trista mention the SNOMED CT codes, which are, um, you know, sent in the eCare plan. Those codes are all linked to these different um, types of educations and procedures and interventions and things like that. Those are all in the background. You don't really need to worry about those, but they are also displayed here in the search grading just in case you want to see what it is, but you don't really have to worry about those. So I'm going to choose an asthma medication review right here. And another thing you'll notice is as I'm going through creating the eCare plan, you'll see a little help panel over here on the side that tells you kind of what you need to do for each field. So you, you're a pharmacist and you've worked in a pharmacy dispensing medications for years, so you know how to do that. But eCare and documenting this in a pharmacy is fairly new to a lot of people. So it's not as intuitive as you may think. So that's why we have these uh, tool tips and pointers to kind of help you through this. Now, the next field we're gonna choose here is the type of service. Is this an initial e-care or is it a follow-up? So since this is the first time we're doing this, this is gonna be an initial one. Later on next month, um, or whenever Timmy comes back and we're following up on that, that's when you would do it as a follow-up plan. So I'm gonna choose initial. Next, we let the e-care plan know how are we doing this communication? Is this gonna be face-to-face -face or over the telephone? In this case, let's, let's say that we're doing it face-to-face. -face. And then next, we put the start date. I'm just gonna keep today's date as the default. This is a required field. You could also then put an end date for us in the e-care or you can leave it open-ended. The end date is optional. I'm gonna leave this one open-ended and so I'm, I'm gonna skip that one right there. And then after that is the confidentiality level. For the most part, you're just gonna keep this as normal, but there are a few other options here, restricted and very restricted, but we'll keep it as normal. And then you wanna indicate what insurance plans you're going to associate with this e-care plan. So usually a patient will have one or two or three insurances that you may wanna include in there. Um, I just have a test plan over here because this is a dummy system, so I'm just gonna include that one here. Once we enter in this basic demographic information and you know the service event that we're creating the eCare plan for, the next step we're gonna move to is the medication history. And when you look at the layout of the eCare document, you're gonna notice I'm on patient information here, but there's a lot of different steps that were mentioned, um, things such as medication history, health concerns, goals, interventions, evaluations. We're gonna take you step by step through this process. Think of it like when you're ordering something uh, online with Amazon or you're buying a plane ticket on an airline's website. You know, you go step by step through each page. Um, that's kind of what we're doing here. You go step by step through each step of the e-care plan. So next thing we're gonna do here is go to medication history. Now, in the e-care plan example that Kim had mentioned, Timmy is on three meds that we want to look at over here for the e-care plan. One was the fluticasone, one was the albuterol, and one was the Monta, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation, the Montalucast. So I've taken the liberty of entering this stuff into the system beforehand, and you can see they're all showing up here. And now here, if you had more medications here, you can also choose whether you want to include them as part of the e-care plan or not. And then we also have an indicator here of whether this prescription is a currently active medication or not an active medication. Since I just filled these medications today, they're going to show up as active. But for example, if this is a medication that was filled two months ago and they haven't gotten a refill since then, it's going to come up as being inactive. Um, if there are other medications also being taken by the patient, but they don't get them at your pharmacy, they get them at another pharmacy, you can also enter those medications into the system. There's a tab here called medications filled at other pharmacies, where here you can add new active medications. I'm not gonna do it right now, um, but you guys kind of get the idea of how this would be done. You can add as many other medications as you want to, and you're probably familiar with this. This screen is also accessible from the patient um, demographic screen, like the general one. So this is where you'd enter that stuff in here. Now I'm gonna click this button here that says confirm active medications and continue to health concerns. So when I click that, since I'm creating this for the first time, it's just gonna display the active medications again, just to confirm it one more time. We wanna make sure we're not including anything that's not supposed to be there or forgetting anything. I'm gonna confirm this. And next up, we move on to the health concerns. So over here, 
this is where we list what are like the problems associated with this e-care plan? Like what problems are causing Timmy to need this intervention and this um, help from the pharmacy? So right now we don't have anything here. I'm gonna click on add new health concern here. So one of the, so there's two different types of health concerns that we have in here right now, drug therapy problems and allergies. There's another one that we're gonna be adding soon as well. E-care, it's a, living, breathing thing. The standards are being updated all the time, and as new things come, we work on adding them in there, but right now, these are the two we have. So I'm gonna add a drug therapy problem, which was shown in the slides. And that drug therapy problem that was presented was that the medication dose was too low for one of the medications. So here we go, Medica medication dose too low. And for the description, I'm just gonna say, um, dosage of medicine too low, and the date, I'll just keep as today's date that we noticed this, and you can put a time if you want to. Um, problem reason, I'll say that the lower dosage was working before, but no longer is enough. And this is free text, you can kind of type in what you want to do. A lot of things are codified using the SNOMED CT codes, but I think when they created the eCare plan, they also realized you cannot codify everything out there. There's so many things out there, so that's why there are a lot of free text fields as well. And now here we want to choose what medication is associated with this health concern. Which medication do we have the low dosage for? And this was for the fluticasone. So I'm gonna click that, and these are the medications that were included in the eCare. I can just select which one I want, and then I'm done, and there you go, fluticasone is there. I'm gonna save that. Now that's one health concern. Um, each eCare plan has to have at least at least one health concern linked to it, but you don't have to limit it to one. You could have multiple health concerns linked to an eCare plan. And in this situation, that's exactly what we have. So I'm gonna add the other health concern that was in that slide, um, which was an overuse of the albuterol. Medication overuse right here. And um, the description, I'm just gonna say, and then for the reason, we can say asthma is acting up, so Timmy resorts to using the inhaler even when not appropriate. And again, down here, we have to choose what medications are associated with this health concern, and we said it's the albuterol, so I'm gonna choose that, and then I'm done. So now I have a couple of health concerns here, um, I'm happy with that, so now I'm gonna go on and move on to the next one, which is goals. Now goals here, each eCare plan has to have at least one goal linked to it, but you can add multiple goals if you'd like. And goals, when I click add new goal here, goals are a free text field. They're not codified or anything like that, so you can go ahead and type in whatever you want here. So one of the goals that was mentioned was we want less sick days from school because of Timmy's asthma. And then what's the goal target date? Let's say that we want to check on this one month from now, because we mentioned that he's missing an X amount of days each month because of his uh, asthma. So at least two days per month. So we want to see, like, okay, last month he missed two days. Let's see what happens next month if we make these changes. So I'm going to put in here 1202 as the goal target date, and what health, what health concerns are related to the goal. If we had chosen only one health concern, then this would auto-populate over here because we know which health concern we're dealing with, but we put in two health concerns here. So now we need to choose which health concern is related to a goal, and you can choose one health concern, two health concerns, it doesn't matter. So I'm gonna put both of these on here because I feel like both of these are related to this goal, so I'm gonna choose those. So I'm gonna save that. And there we have one of the goals listed here. Now, there is two more goals in here, so I'm gonna add them in here real quick. And I'm just gonna put the same date, and I'm gonna choose both of the health concerns here as well. Save, and I'll quickly add the next goal as well. And you'll notice like this is such a unique goal, right? We said limiting, we're gonna say limiting Uncle John from smoking inside the house. So. This is one of the reasons why you can't codify all of these goals because 
there's no way you can create a goal for something this specific. That's why it's all free text for the goals. Okay, now I have my goals recorded into the system. Next up, we want to go to the interventions. So what interventions are we going to do at the pharmacy to help out with this e-care plan? There were, I think, five or six interventions listed on that slide. For the sake of time, I'm just going to include a few of them here. So I can click on here, and you have to have at least one intervention per e-care plan, but just like before, you could have multiple if you'd like, but at least one is required. So I'm going to add a new intervention here, and there are a few different types of interventions. So when you create an intervention, there are referrals, there are patient educations, and then there are appointments here as well. So, well, first I should choose, sorry, I'm going to choose the goal that this intervention is related to. So um, the first goal that I'm going to assess over here is less sick days from school and less trips to the emergency room. Um, or actually, you, well, we can only choose one, it looks like. So less sick days from school. And what am I going to do for this intervention? I'm going to do an education over here. So what I'm going to do is a medical equipment education. So this is to request a new peak flow meter. As we had mentioned, they lost their peak flow meter. And then here's the date. I'm just going to do today's date for this. And the status is active. Um, in, usually in an initial e-care plan, the status of all of these intervention types is going to be active. Later on, when we have follow-up ones, you can ch change those to being completed or aborted or suspended, depending on what's going on with the intervention. And then there are priorities here. How are we doing this? Routine as needed, emergency or ASAP. So um, we want to do this. I'm just going to choose routine for the sake of simplicity. I'm going to add this education here to this uh, intervention. So this is one intervention that we have over here. So I'm going to save that. Now I can add another intervention here. So now I'm going to choose another goal. So less trips to the emergency room. Um, and I can choose another intervention type. And I'm going to add another type of education here. I'm going to say asthma medication. And same thing, routine, I'll add this education. And actually, I'm going to change the goal over here. I'm going to use this for limiting Uncle John from smoking on the side of the house, because I think asthma education makes more sense for that. So uh, we want to educate the family about how serious asthma can be. And so I'm going to associate this goal with this intervention over here. And then we can add another one here as well. And I'm going to say less trips to the emergency room here. And here I can say an intervention is an asthma medication review. Okay, so now I have a bunch of interventions here. I'm happy with what I have here. Next, and the final step that we have here are health evaluations. Over here, we want to add a health status evaluation. So it's basically we're doing an evaluation um, of how their health is at the moment. So I'm going to add a new health status evaluation and the evaluation date is going to be today. And you've got to choose goals that are associated with this evaluation. I'm just going to choose all three of them here. You have to choose at least one. And then what is the goal status of these goals? I'm going to say that we have not yet achieved any of these goals because we just started this eCare. Um, later on, on a follow-up eCare, you can indicate if any of these goals have been achieved or not. But since it's the initial one, nothing has been achieved yet. And I'm going to just enter in some text yet here to say it's not achieved yet. So now once I have this health status evaluation in here, I can save this and you'll see it here. Now you'll notice down here it says that the eCare plan is ready to publish. So now I can click on finalize and publish to publish it. So we have a few options here. So the first option here is to save a draft. So you see this is a fairly simple eCare plan. So there wasn't as much to it as there are for some other ones. But if this is a really complicated one, it may take you a little bit longer to do it. So you may want to enter in some of the information and then come back to it later. So that's why we allow you to save a draft of it so you don't have to lose your information. The next option is to finalize and publish. When you do finalize and publish, what happens is it saves all the information of the eCare and then it'll publish it to the CPESN um, USA servers. And from then, CPSN takes care of it and shares it with the appropriate parties. Once it's 
once uh, eCare plan is published, you cannot edit it anymore because it's already been shared with others. So changes you reflect here would not be reflected on the published ver version without publishing again. If you did need to make a change on something, you would have to do a follow-up, make your appropriate changes, and publish again. The third option we have over here is finalize without publishing. This is there in case you want to create an eCare plan, but you want to use it only for your own internal purposes and you don't need to share it. Or if you're part of a state that has a CTESN network that doesn't um, allow publishing yet, or you're in a state that does not have a CTESN network at all, and you still want to do eCare plans and get things going, this is where you would do finalize without publishing. These records stay in your system only and are not shared. I'm going to choose finalize and publish because I want to, you know, share this eCare plan and, you know, hopefully get paid for this. So I'm going to click finalize and publish. It's going to ask me one more time, are you sure you want to publish the file? I'm going to say yes. And you'll see it's going to connect to the server. And once it's uploaded, it's going to let me know that it was uploaded successfully. Once it's uploaded, it is also then going to display the eCare plan to me in a user-friendly format. So the actual eCare document that gets sent to CPSN, it's all, it's, you know, it's codified. There's a lot of unreadable data in the background. This gives me a user-friendly version that I can look at and I can print or you know share, do whatever I wanna do. I'm gonna close this here right now. So now that that eCare plan is done, you're gonna see that it shows up here and it shows that it's published. I can come back to this at any time that I want to, click on this, and it's gonna show me everything that I did, but you'll notice I can't change anything here because it's already published, so everything's locked up in read-only mode. If I wanna view that eCare plan again in, user, uh, you know, in a user-friendly mode, I can click on View Report, and it's gonna show me that same report that I had before. A few other places where this links up within the BestRx system, if I go to Timmy's patient demographic here, many of you are familiar with the documents tab over here. So over here, you know, you can link and scan various documents that are related to a patient, excuse me, by scanning them in or through email or whatever. But we also have a tab here called eCare plans. So any eCares that are created for a patient will show up right here. So you can see the one that I created. If I click on that one, you're going to see that eCare plan right there on the side, and you can just scroll down and view all the information that we entered in there. From here, you can print it if you need to, and you can also download it so that you can then share it or email it with somebody. Uh, it's some different things that you can do over here. You zoom in, zoom out. For those of you who are on our standard tier of BestRx, you know you also have this calendar icon on the side over here. When you click that calendar icon, it shows a calendar of any you know, patient events or med sync, things like that you have scheduled in your pharmacy. So you can see some of the eCare stuff that I entered in here automatically syncs up with the calendar. And now this calendar is very new, so we're trying to add some more functionality on there. But you can see if I click this, you'll see the eCare stuff that I entered in here for the patients. So you can see the medical equipment education, the asthma education and things like that that I have there. If I go over to next month to December, you'll see some of the future things that I also put in here, the goals that I have for the eCare. So if you're utilizing the calendar, you can get an idea of what goals you need to follow up on, the eCare things you need to follow up on. So it's very useful for keeping track of that. Since this is all um, patient health information, PHI, you know that you should not be using a Google Calendar or Outlook Calendar for any of this because none of that is HIPAA compliant. So that's why using this internal calendar within BestRx is the best way to go for those kind of things. For those of you who use our dashboard, you can also see certain eCare events listed on the dashboard as well. So you can always know for the day how many eCare events you have there and you can click on there and it'll show you some of the eCare events. So that is a uh, quick demo of some of the eCare functionality within BestRx. Um, there are some things that were mentioned in the presentation before that we did not show yet, things such as vitals uh, and then immunizations and things like that. Those are things that we are working to add to eCare in the near future. We have ways where you can link vitals to a prescription, but we're gonna be adding ways that you can link 
vital readings to patients and they also include them as part of eCare. Um, many of you are using the new integration we have with, for immunizations with SMP that allows you to automatically report to the immunization registry and also pre presents you immunization opportunities. So we want to take that one step further and then also include the ability to report these immunizations into the eCare plan. And we want to try, we're trying to figure out ways to make it as simple as possible. So those are some of the things coming out with eCare in the future that we are working on at the moment. So that being said, I'm going to stop now real quick and then open this up to questions. We have about 10 minutes left to go. So I'm gonna open this up to questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please type it into the chat bar and then we will answer those questions as they come through. Our first question came in here from Samir. Um, hi, Samir. So his question was, is eCare available in New Jersey? Um, if we go back to the map, Kim and Trista, I forgot, is New Jersey one of them that's active right now? Yes, there is a CPSN network in New Jersey, yes. Okay, great, thanks for that. And then um, another question that we have is from Uzoma. This is, are we able to document encounters involving patients using other pharmacies meds? Yes, you definitely can do that. So one of the things that I mentioned when we were going over the active medication list was that not only will we automatically display any active medications that are in your pharmacy, you could also enter in any medications that are being taken at another pharmacy. And not just medications at another pharmacy, but even if you want to include over-the-counter medicines that don't require a prescription, things that they take regularly, such as um, aspirin or something like that, or vitamins or things like that, you can also include those as part of the eCare. Another question that just came in, how do we get paid for doing the eCare plans? Um, I will let Kim or Trista handle that one as they can probably speak to that better. Sure. So the way that it works, um, it, it doesn't necessarily, in, in, it really depends on the program. So when we're working, and when I say we, I mean when CPSN networks, when we are working with payers to negotiate a program, we really try to look to what they're interested in, in terms of how the program is structured. We do have programs in place that are going on right now where submission of a care plan equals a certain amount of payment for either that month or for a specific encounter. So um, that can be part of it. The other way to look at it is, let's say that there is a plan that says, well, we're going to open up these medical side billing codes. We're going to sort of do the credentialing of the pharmacies on the medical side and have them submit code like CPT codes, let's say, on the medical side. Well, if you do that, then you need to make sure that the work you did with the patient is documented so that if you're ever audited on the use of those codes that you can prove not only your prescription dispensing, but the aspects of clinical care that you provided and care coordination etc. And so the eCare plan is your essentially or the, the clinical documentation aspect where you put the information is really that source where you would capture what you're doing with the patient to support you know a billing code that you're submitting for instance. Excellent. Thank you so much Trista for that. Um, another question related to geography. Is there a CPESN in Maryland? And looking at the map in the slide, it does not look like. I'm not sure if that's one of the new ones that came on board since or if Maryland is, is. still working on that one. Yeah, okay, actually so CPESN Maryland just started um, in October, literally. I think September 30th they officially formed a chapter. So yes, they are now in existence. Okay, great news. So, yeah, we have a, I know we have a lot of BestRx users in Maryland, so that's great news for our uh, user base. Do you know what the other few far states were that were not on that map that just came on board recently? I'm trying to think. Washington is one of the newer ones. Um, I'm trying to think of other ones that aren't, weren't represented on the map. Um, Delaware may, I assume, would be on the map, but just in case not. Um, that's most of them. Some of the Northeast is sort of um, reorganizing themselves right now in terms of how they're laid out. So some of it was Northeastern networks. Um, 
I believe Vermont is either close to establishing or recently establishing, so we're slowly getting more presence in the Northeast as well. Okay, excellent. Um, the next question that I have is, if I am busy, can I go back and document into ECAN the next day? Um, and yes, absolutely you can. So uh, there is that button on the eCare screen for saving a draft. So at any time when you're creating the eCare plan, once you've entered in the patient's information, at any time after that, you can just save it as a draft and then come back to it whenever you want to. So we realize that eCare um, can sometimes take a few minutes and then you get interrupted all the time. So you can't just always submit it right away. So you, you can always save the draft and come back to it. Um, Next question is, how can I get the eCare module on your system if you do not currently have it? If you do not have eCare, call us and let us know, and then we can talk to you about how you can get that activated. eCare plans are included as part of the standard tier. As, you, um, as many of you know, recently we introduced um, a tiered system to the software, basic, standard, and premium. So if you are on standard or premium, eCare is included as part of the uh, BestRx software. Um, but I can contact you after this and we can talk about that. And, and if anyone's interested, just you know, call our support line and we'll help you out. Another question that came through is how does CPESN sustain itself? That is a question we get pretty commonly. And so the way we are structured is that participating pharmacies do pay participation fees. So it is $85 per pharmacy per month. However, the reason we do that is because whenever we get into an agreement with a payer on your behalf, the key there is that all the dollars flow through from the payer to you. So we, we believe that transparency is very important in pharmacy right now. And we know that at times you are part of, um, you may have an opportunity to be part of payer contracts where some unknown amount is taken out of the middle from what the payer pays, and then you get something and you're not sure what happens in the middle. The idea with CPSN is you always know what your participation fees are and we tell you how we spend them so that it's very transparent um, and so you, you know what the costs are to sustain the infrastructure and then whenever we get a payer contract that in, um, has implications for your pharmacy for instance then a hundred percent of those payment dollars would flow through from the payer to you. Thank you Trista. Um, another question regarding a payment. Um, is a payment through medical insurance or is it through the prescription plan? Or is something else uh, It really could be any of the above. So um, when we look at payers, it's not just traditional payers like health plans or PBMs. In the case of services provided by CPSN pharmacies, the payer could be an accountable care organization or a hospital or health system. It could also be more traditional payers like health plans. It could also be, excuse me, a health and self-insured employer. So it really depends who's interested in, in paying for those services. Often though, like I described at the beginning of the call, because the benefits of your services are typically seen on the medical side of the budget, we do feel like the health plan or the medical side is the ideal place for these services to be contracted. But if a specific health plan says, well, you know what, our pharmacy, our PBM, or whoever does our pharmacy administration for claims already has a contract with that pharmacy, we'd rather do that, then we would certainly, you know, go that route. But generally speaking, uh, the services align best with the medical side of the budget. Okay. And to kind of follow up on that, will do the pharmacies have to contract for the medical um, side of it on their own, or does CPSN help them out with that if they don't have the medical contracts? Yeah, so the whole idea of CPSN, again, is the financial sustainability of community-based pharmacy. So we do that a couple of different ways. Um, first of all, pharmacies who participate with us, if you are interested in doing things like chronic care management or um, transitional care management, which are Medicare physician side payment codes that pharmacies can participate in, if you want to do those, those you can negotiate locally with your local physicians or with hospital systems. We provide you with the tools and the sample contracts and things like that to go about uh, initiating those things locally. We also, along with the leadership of your local network, 
we go out and we talk to your state Medicaid agencies and other, you know, payers who would be of interest in your market. And so the network has to be big enough. So that's the first thing. We don't really go pitch to payers if there's only five pharmacies participating in a given state. So the first thing is to get a network of sufficient size that would attract a payer's attention. Um, but the good news is, in most areas of the country, that's been a, a pretty achievable thing to do. And then once we have a network of sufficient size, then a combination of us at the USA staff level and your local network leaders, again, develop a plan, and we help, we give you the marketing materials and the branding and all that sort of, of thing to take to your local meeting so that you can keep those local payer relationships local, but you have us as sort of this backup support um, to take to meetings with you as needed. And so for most local networks, I think um, I participate in these payer meetings as requested by local networks on a pretty frequent basis. And I think it works out well this way because it really gives your local, again, your local leaders having that sense of control and owning the relationship, which is really important but then you have the backup from our standpoint on, well, what might this program actually be structured like and what would be a reasonable price point for that type of service and how would, you know, what sort of quality measures might work best. That's where the expertise of our USA staff comes in. And that's, that's part of what you're paying for with that $85 per pharmacy per month. Okay, great. Thank you. So to bounce off of that, the next few questions also involve more things about payment and things like that. So one question is, are point of care tests being paid through eCare plans? Um, point of care testing is a little bit challenging for a variety of reasons. There are ways, so Kim described the ability to document lab results in the advanced sort of future state e-care plan functionality. So if you did point of care testing, there would be in a future state a place to document the results of that. Um, in terms of payer programs related to point of care testing, from my perspective, those are a little bit tougher for, a, for a, honestly, a, a longer list of reasons that we probably have time for on this webinar. But it, it is safe to say that point of care testing does have a place, those results have a place within the e-care plan so that you could communicate those out to other care team members. Thanks. And to add to the point of care testing, um, one thing that we have not made an announcement on yet is we do have medical billing coming in BestRx in the second quarter of 2019. We're working with a partner and we're going to be piloting some medical billing capabilities. And with that, we'll be able to get paid for some point of care tests as long as you have medical contracts. But we will send out more information about that early next year. So stay tuned for that. Um, Next question, since Maryland just started in October, how many pharmacists will it take to be able to negotiate payment? I guess that, that's a question that applies for any network, I guess, right? Sure, and it's really not a set threshold. It's obviously gonna be a different number in Maryland than it is in California, right? Because it really depends on how many pharmacies do you need for a payer to feel that that's adequate to serve that, that geography and the population that's there. So um, we have specific information that we give to each network about what would make them quote unquote adequate in the eyes of a payer, both from a per population standpoint and in a geographical sense, like when do you have enough geographical distribution with your network that you have geographic network adequacy. So that's another service that USA provides to the local networks is that we take the pharmacies participating in your area and give you regular feedback on what that adequacy calculation looks like for your network. It doesn't mean there are plenty of networks out there right now who have not yet achieved adequacy and still are either in the final stages of a payer contract or have one active right now. So it's not to say that you have to reach adequacy at your local network level, um, but clearly somebody's got to join. I think the biggest challenge that networks have right now is that pharmacies say, well, I'm going to sit over here and just wait on the fence until I hear from CPSN that they have a payer contract in my area. And honestly, that approach, um, there's, full of, there's lots of holes in that approach. But I would say probably one of the biggest holes, a really gaping hole, to be honest with you, in that approach, sort of the sit and wait for the payer announcement, is that by the time that payer announcement would be announced, you would probably have missed the opportunity to be in. Because many, many months before it's announced, the contract's being finalized, we're looking at who's in the network for the geography, the, the payer's focused on, et cetera. So you really need to be in the network up front 
in order for you to be part and represented as part of those payer discussions. So even for a new network like Maryland, it's important to kind of get in early as compared to sitting and waiting because the more folks that sit and wait, the longer it will be until that network is able to go out there and start representing itself to payers. Great. And then for multiple pharmacy owners, they would have to pay membership fees for each individual location, correct? That is correct, but sometimes, you know, we've had lots of folks say, it depends how many pharmacies you have. If you have two or three, sometimes folks say, well, sure, I'll sign on all two or three. Sometimes when we talk with folks that have five or 10 or 15 stores, they say, you know what, I'm going to pick, I'm, I'm going to pick three or I'm going to pick five, you know, a portion of them and sign those on. It, there's nothing that says you have to sign all of them up. But I think key is you want to be, um, so maybe they pick their larger stores or they pick stores that are geographically a little bit distant from each other so that if a payer opportunity comes up, there's a chance that at least one, if not multiple of them could uh, participate. So that's generally how multi-store owners have handled the opportunity, but really it's you know up to you as a store owner how you want to handle that. If you want to put all of them in, a portion of them, what have you. You can always add, once you have a participation agreement established, it's fairly easy to add locations or you know, remove locations over time as the need may be. Okay, great. Then what happens if a pharmacy that is not a CPESN member publishes a plan? That is that data just gets... Question for Beth Sarak. So the way it's structured right now, we only, what we do each month is not only for BestRx, but for every, every system out there that has eCare plan, we say, here are the current CPSN pharmacy participants. And we only want data for those participants. We, we don't want data for pharmacies that are not participating. So those would basically say, so if you are not a CPSN participant, but you did want to use eCare plans, then that data would stay local to your system. So if you would decide to join CPSN, let's say during the month of November, then at the beginning of December, we would publish that list, that new list back to, back to BestRx with your information on there, and then they would know that you're a pharmacy that is in the network and has agreed to data sharing. Okay, great. So yeah, I think maybe we can handle that on our end to make sure that certain data does not get um, uploaded when it doesn't need to be. And I'm sure you guys have something on your end too that discards data that's not part of a CPSN member. Um, another question that came in is how do you sign up? I can send information on that, on how to sign up to you after the webinar. We'll email everyone that's on here with information about that afterwards. Um, there's another question that came through and I may have to unmute the caller to clarify this one. Um, how would this work with hospice? How could we send this clinical information ourselves? Um, Kim and Trista, are you able to answer that or would you like more clarification on that? I think I understand what they're getting at. And generally okay. speaking, I, my sense is you're really wanting to know how to share the information locally. So if you create a care plan and you want to use it for care coordination purposes, so there's two ways to look at that. The first is um, they, BestRx gives you a printable version of the care plan. So, you know, if need be, you could take your care plan and even use a, a lower tech solution, let's say like fax, right, to share that over with a provider or a care manager so that they could see the robust type of activity you're doing for their patient. Um, there's also, you know, from a BestRx perspective, I don't know if there's any abilities you have baked into the system that allows them to share uh, this type of document once it's produced externally. So I'll let you comment on that. But I think the fact that the system does give you a print option that you're viewing the human readable page is actually a big advantage. There's a number of other systems that do not do that. And so readers can't actually see the care plan, but you not only get the chance to see it yourself and make sure that what you wanted to be in there is in there, but you can also then print that obviously and then share it with whatever other care team members locally might need it. Yeah, that, that was good. You, you covered a lot of that right there. So definitely what you mentioned, you can print that out and send it yourself. And then we, for those that have the option, the ability to, to do internet faxing, we are going to be adding a button there pretty soon where you can just hit fax and it'll go through your internet fax provider. And all the internet fax providers we use are HIPAA compliant. So you don't have to worry about PHI. Uh, we thought about adding an email button on there 
but then we were advised that that's not the best idea because email is not a HIPAA, HIPAA secure mode of communication. So we can't just like, you know, create an attachment with this information and send it over email because that would be a violation of uh, the patient's privacy. But like I said, printing it or faxing it, those are the two best ways to share that. Um, another question that came through, does eCare plan bill car insurance, care insurance for accidental coverages? I'm not sure. Sure. Um, I don't know if that's for like like workers' comp type insurance. I'm not quite sure what they mean by that, but no. I mean, well, maybe I should back up. You could use the care plan for whatever you want to use it for locally, and that's part of the beauty of it. Is is instead of a payer dictating a platform for you, you now have a platform where it's again, like Kim said, it's your data. You put in there what you need to take care of your patients. Um, in terms of looking for payment opportunities through CPSN networks and specifically for pharmacies that are participants in CPSN networks, largely we're looking for health plans are the type of insurers that we approach. Um, Self-insured employers that have, you know, someone that administers claim for them, claims, but where they're sort of assuming the risk would be the other type of group and, and hospitals, ACOs, health systems. Those are the kind of groups. But as it relates to insurers, it's mostly medical insurance or health plans that we would be approaching. I hope that, I'm not sure if that answers the question or not, but I hope it did. Yeah, no, you did a great job, I think. And I think, um, yeah, and I think the way I understood it is if it was like an Allstate or State Farm or something like that, that would not be something that would be really part of the e-care network because that's outside the health insurance um, umbrella. I hope that answers your question. And then another question came through about what about the medical part of the car insurance? I mean, I guess that would just depend. It's a, I don't think there's a black or white answer on that one, right, Trista? And whether the medical part of the car insurance would cover that? I, I suspect not, because a lot of that comes back to the health plan, right? And what the health plan, so the medic, if someone was in a car accident, the medical part would pay, you know, whatever the, the plan assumes to be part of the care for that person. Um, so really, I think no matter which angle you go with that, it keeps coming back to the health insurance. To the health insurance, yeah. That's what I would assume as well. Great, yeah. yeah. Great questions, though. I don't think I've ever thought of that one. So good question. Me <laughs> um, it, looks like, it looks like that is all that we have. Those are all the questions that came through. Thank you, everyone, for this great discussion. Always great to see everyone engaged and answering, answering such questions, even the tough ones that stump us. So thank you so much. Um, like I said, we'll send out some additional information after this webinar on how you can sign up with um, CPESN and eCare if you're interested. And if you have any additional questions that you just wanna ask in general, feel free to call us or email us or contact us through our website and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Uh, Trista and Kim, thank you so much for joining me again on this webinar. It's great to have you both here. Thank you, Hemel. Our pleasure. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, again for attending.